welcome back to uh, another episode of the Chronic Pain Club Talk Show, where we're um, filming this live on YouTube on Sunday evenings. And this week, I am delighted to be joined by um, a man I've sort of interfaced quite a lot with over the last couple of years um, through various settings, um, Russ Caper, who's a uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis um, advocate, a trustee um, of a charity, and um, also a poet, which we'll dig into a little bit tonight. Russ, welcome along. Um, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, looking forward yeah. to it. Thanks for, um, thanks for finding some time on your Sunday evening. I know it's not the easiest slot for some people, so I, I do appreciate you joining us on a Sunday. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we, we seem to have crossed paths quite a few times with various focus groups and meetings and, and things like that, but it's probably the first time we've got to sit down and have a proper chat where there isn't sort of work to do. So <laughs> for those of you that um, are not familiar, um, you know, we've... Do you want to just tell us a little bit before we dig into the sort of like the condition and everything, who you are, where you're from and, and that sort of thing? Uh, obviously, Russ, I'm from Manchester. Um, I'm involved, I'm a trustee of the Psoriasis Association now. I just recently joined the board there. And I do other advocacy work with Innovation Health Manchester and the Manchester Art, which is the Associated Research Collaboration, and with the Muscogee Research Centre at Manchester. And I've also done work with uh, different um, pharmaceutical companies where I've gone along and spoken to them. And I was involved first with the Psoriasis Shout Out that was in Manchester many years ago. That was my first involvement. And now I do pretty much everything. I've been involved in COVID research in Manchester. And at the moment, I'm involved with a community nursing project and a, jigs a project called the data jigsaw, which is bringing together people's data with psoriatic arthritis, to try and see if there's any um, patterns that they can look at. So, yeah, I'm pretty busy at the moment, right? getting involved in fingers in lots of different pies, but it's good, good fun. Yeah, you do amazing stuff. And also the thing that's always struck me about, and we can dig into this a lot more, I'm sure, over the next sort of 30, 40 minutes or so, is that you you do a lot of the, should I say, like in, in, a, in a world of social media, you do the sort of, really important stuff but also like what's the like maybe the less glamorous stuff so there's lots of people sharing their stories online nowadays but it always strikes me how how willing you are to do the research side of things and 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 let's say it's almost like a little bit less glamorous side isn't it well yeah it is you know and i mean last year i had um quite an experience doing some research with one of the doctors from salford royal where she asked me if i'd go and have three samples of skin taken off the backside in the morning and three samples taken out my backside in the evening, which sounded a great idea <laughs> at the time, and obviously said she would pay me for it. But the problem was I couldn't sit down for a week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just amazed you, you thought that sounded like a good deal at the time. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like a good idea. I thought, oh, it might take a flight for me to go somewhere. Or, yeah, I couldn't sit down for a week. <laughs> but the, the, the premise behind the uh, research was fantastic. They were looking to see if... Your skin reacted differently in the morning to the evening. Oh, okay. If so, would it be a better, a better time for you to take your medicine? Would it be in the morning or in the evening? Yeah, and, think about that. Yeah, the premise behind it is brilliant. So, yeah, I, my hand was volunteered. Yeah, I'll do that. And yeah, I've done loads of little things like that over the years where I've said, go on, I'll, I'll have a go, see what happens, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, always willing. Oh, yeah, no, I appreciate. And like I say, on behalf of another patient, I really appreciate that because, like I say, that is a lot of the. That's where the real change can be made, but it's such a yeah. slow burn, isn't it? It's like you know, whenever I've been involved in that side of stuff, and I know you, you like me, sort of speak up for a lot of what like the likes of um Global Psoriasis Atlas and people like that are doing, and it is a, such a slow burn, isn't it? That the stuff you do today might take weeks, months, even years to have that impact, but it does have a real tangible impact down the line doesn't it well it does yeah absolutely you know i was involved with the um i was on the steering committee for the psoriatic arthritis priority setting partnership and you get the research priorities come out at the end of that and now i'm starting to see that research priorities being taken up around the country and you think what i did over and this was during covid and it was all got done over zoom you know, and I'm starting to see those research um, things being taken up now. And you think, yeah, it was worth doing that because now people like me are being researched and, you know, maybe the results may be two, three years down the line, but hopefully people like us will benefit in the future. And that's what it's all about, really. 
Yeah, it really is. And like as, as somebody that I remember like as a teenager being told that these sort of mythical things with like which went on to be biologics were coming down the line and all the trials and stuff that went into that. And then suddenly you get I got to 30 and these things are available and you don't really take a minute to think about all the people that contributed to that research and the trials and everything to get it to to that point, you know. So um so yeah, like I say on behalf of the community, big thank you for for all that you do of that. And like I say, there's so many times I've dropped into a focus group or something and seen you sitting there. So I know how busy you are because <laughs> for that to happen several times, you must be doing a few of them. Um, so do you want to just like, if we just wind, wind back a bit a little, just um, because the community really like hearing like the um, diagnosis story or you know your journey with, with your condition. So um, do you want to just sort of let us have that like bit of backstory and then we can, we can dig into the other stuff a bit more. Well, I, I could probably trace we sorry, I took arthritis back to probably around about the age of 13. But after that, it, it was a strange time because I went to work and I was okay. And I had bits of psoriasis around my ears and I had a couple of problems with one of my fingers. It was swelled up occasionally. And I never really gave it much thought. And then one morning I was getting up to go to work, tried to get out of bed. Both my ankles had bloomed up overnight. Couldn't walk. So it's like, ah, right, this ain't normal. I've done nothing wrong. And I went to see the doctor at the local hospital and he diagnosed me with psoriatic arthritis. And of course, I'm like, wow, what the hell's that? I'd never heard of it. He never explained to me what it was. He just said to me, you're going to have to give up football. I was like, devastated because I played football like all my life. I played cricket, I loved sport. And all of a sudden, I'm being told this is happening. And I'm thinking, I might end up in a wheelchair or, you know, what what's going on? Because nothing was explained. And what's good nowadays is there's a lot more stuff explained, which I really appreciate. So I was just basically thrown out of the hospital thinking, right, it's at the end of my life. Can I go back to work? You know, and I was off, I was off work for about 11, 12 weeks, something like that, till my ankles went down. And I was thinking about things at the time. I was thinking... When I was at school, I always used to be injured. I was always carrying a knot with my ankles or my knees. But I played on, played through him because I never thought, I, mean, I don't want to miss the game. I want to play, I want to play. And when I think back now, I think that was just definitely the start. Sorry, I took arthritis. Because when I was around 13, I had a throat infection called Quinzes. And apparently it's quite rare. I mean, I went to the hospital with my mum at the time. And they had to get another doctor in to, like, cross-examine me or whatever they call it, I can't remember, because <laughs> neither of them had ever seen it before. Yeah, and I've not heard of it. Yeah, it's a strep throat condition where it blocks up one side of your throat and it can have pretty dangerous consequences. They were saying, you know, it can kill you if it gets in both sides of your throat, so it blocks your throat up. So a classical strep throat starts a like, psoriasis journey and that. You do hear that um, a lot of people get psoriasis in particular, don't they, from an infection or a bout yeah. of poor health? Yeah, especially around like strep throat. Yeah. So that was pretty much the start. And then after like the, the 12 weeks off work, like, my ankles had gone back down. I thought, all right, this isn't, this isn't too bad, this. And I went back to work. And then the psoriasis started to get bad. And the joints had calmed down. And... Pretty much from then on, I think it's 29 times I've been in hospital. I spent over three years of my life on the ward at Salford Royal, you know, and pretty run the whole gamut of treatments that you could possibly ever imagine. At one point, I was in for 10 weeks, I was home for two weeks, and I was in for another six weeks. You know, I was never right. I was atherodermic. I was 100% covered. And, of course... As well as that, I was having flares. My joints were going bad as well, so you can't use the treatments properly. You know, you can't open a... If your psoriasis is bad and you can't open a part of the cream, your psoriasis is going to stay bad. <laughs> it's just like, that's the way it goes, you know. Yeah. So I'm really thankful to the nurses at Salford Royal. They were magnificent with me, to be honest. Taught me a lot as well, little tips and things to do. And, you know, looked after me and gave me a lot of inspiration. But well, of course, like with everything, you know, with living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, there's the downside of it and there's the effect it has on you mentally. Yeah. And that's, I know that's something you and I have talked quite a bit about, yeah. isn't it, in other, in other forums and 
Yeah. So yeah, I, I, yeah, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about it? just for for the audience's benefit? By the way, guys, nobody gets any questions pre-sent to them here, so we always have that caveat. If somebody isn't comfortable answering it, then you absolutely don't have to answer anything. But if, do you want to talk a little bit more about the impact on that side of it? Well, I think the impact it had on me was I turned to drink, right? Okay, and basically that was my coping mechanism, as when you're in pain and your skin's looking bad and you're feeling down on yourself, the easiest thing in the world is just go to the shop and get a load of beer. And then the next day, it's it's a cycle of you going downwards and downwards. You're in that spiral. You can't get out of it. You know, and I'm not proud of myself for what I did, but it was the way I coped. And thankfully, I was sort of saved when the Sir Isley shout-out come round in Manchester, the first one. Okay. And... I'd been asked um, if I'd like to see a health psychologist. And she's quite a famous one, a doctor, Professor Chris Bundy. And she does a lot of work with um, psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis and what have you. And I was long sought to her, and she encouraged me to start writing. Okay. You know, and that's where the poetry angle come in. And I wrote a poem for the psoriasis shout out, which they made a film out of. And all of a sudden, it gave me something to focus on. I thought, well, I can actually write. You know, I'm quite good at this. I might not be brilliant, but I'm quite good at it. And everybody liked the poem, and people were like, oh, that's brilliant, you know, and I really got something out of that. So I carried on writing, started writing a few football blogs and and you know, different other forms of poem. But most of the poems mostly for my own satisfaction. But I have shared a couple with other people and... I just done one recently for a pharmaceutical company, and they put it was um, what do they call it? A Japanese poem, um, a haiku. Okay, yeah. A haiku, and last week this pharmaceutical pharmaceutical company put me in touch with a Japanese firm who wanted to hear this haiku, and it's going to be used in a marketing thing in um, in Japan. This haiku, <laughs> which is. You think, like, where have I come? Though? All of a sudden, my work's going to be in Japan. It's a bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's really important to sort of, like, stress that, like, because th there's, there's two people on this call, and both of us kind of found a way of coping with the mental sides of living with psoriatic arthritis by putting words on paper. Um, so, you know, I think that was one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on here is to try, you know, because we know, especially in this country, we're not good as as men in particular of, of talking about how we feel. And, and you know, I think we both have similar sort of backgrounds in terms of like football culture and things like that. You're not going to talk about how that how that stuff impacts you. So I think it's really important to, to, um, to sort of for us to focus on that writing side and that 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 sort of outlet it gave you, because if it's worked for me and it's worked for you, then there's there's clearly something in that, isn't there? Yeah, definitely, you know, because you can write to yourself. You don't have to write to other people. Well, I was going through my work that I've done. I've got a big folder of work. And I was going through it before I thought I'd pick a couple of poems out, just in case you might want to read them. Oh, and I was looking through it, I was thinking, <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I remember writing that. Yeah, I enjoyed that one. No, and yeah, and they mean something to you. They don't have to mean something to anybody else. But they mean something to you at that time. You know, and one of the poems I wrote, and it was really, really simple. It was about an old tree at the top of my road that was being knocked down, and I grew up with this tree. And the council cut it down, and I wrote a poem about it, and I read it before. And it was like, it had to be really emotional. Yeah. Thinking about a tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah, but it's what symbolises. I don't suppose yeah. you've got any of these to hand to read one to us, and if you're comfortable to. Yeah, I can read you a quick poem. I can read it. I've got my favourite poem, which... Do you want me to read my favourite poems here? Yeah, careful. whatever you're most comfortable with as well. Right. I'd really appreciate it. I'm sure the audience would as well. This is, a, my, I think, probably my best poem that I wrote as well. It's entitled Autumn. So here we go. It seems to come earlier every year, early September now, and it's here. Summer has gone, it's waved goodbye. The Autumn Avenger arrives in full cry. After 52 years, my body's no wiser. The shock of the cold is the appetizer. Dank, misty, dreary and freezing. Time to turn on the dreaded central heating. Autumn is one of my major crises. My intolerance is at my highest. Aching joints, dried out skin. Thoughts of past trauma start to begin. 
I circle a date, March 21. If I make it that far, my fears will be gone. Dread of the flare, scared of the pain. The last 30 years have all been the same. Imagining, managing carefully, trying to survive. Keeping my dignity, saving my pride. Six months of the year is no big thing. Constantly reminding, it will soon be spring. It seems to get earlier every year. Early September now and it's here. Summer is gone and it's waved goodbye. The Autumn Avenger arrives in full cry. <laughs> that is so relatable. <laughs> so it's, uh, there's so many bits in there. That's, that's the, firstly, thank you for sharing that. Um, and, it, and it isn't easy. And, and, and I don't know what your journey was like, but as somebody that first started writing just to, to release how I felt into the void, not expecting anything back, and then suddenly that connects with people and you start to get things back, that can be quite... Um, you know, terrifying a little bit, but I can't tell you how important it is to share that sort of stuff. Um, you know, for somebody out there that might might be sitting on the same sort of feelings, but don't know how to express it. You know. Yeah. So, so I think a lot of times I've really struggled in the autumn. Like that, I, I, yeah. I think half the time I've been hospital has been in the autumn. You know, it starts to get cold. Your joints start to feel it more. And I remember writing that, and I wrote it. Well, I was 52 when I wrote that poem. I'm 57 now. So I wrote that five years ago. And I think that was the last time I was actually in hospital. Yeah. And I wrote that while I was in hospital, you know, feeling pretty sorry for myself. And I look back on it now and I'm really proud of that poem. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it is that thing of looking forward to the spring. And I think it's important thing that we always have something to look forward to. Yeah. The patients. You know, so now, like, even if it only has to be a little thing as well, you know, a weekend away, like if it's booked in three months' time, and you think, I've got that to look forward to, that will get me through a couple of months. You you have no idea how many times, uh, my wife might be watching this, who has heard that line of needing something to look forward to. Yeah. Because I think people, until you live with a constant unrelenting progressive condition where the days just can feel so long and it seems to sort of cast a shadow over everything you love whether spending time with your family or your hobbies or whatever people can never will never appreciate that need and something to look forward to tomorrow you know and and do you not find maybe it's just me but do you not find that's one of the reasons why you participate and help and research and advocate and you know because it kind of helps that hope for tomorrow a little bit well, absolutely, yeah. You know, and I also feel like I like to give back as well because I've had so much time spent on me at hospital and with my professors and the work that they put in. You know, it's nice to give back and it's nice that there's hope for tomorrow. You know, so anything that I can do to help, like the focus groups we've been in and, you know, if we can make the smallest of differences, I think that's really important. I mean, I remember being out on the shout-out once and we were in Manchester in the Piccadilly Gardens and Professor Griffiths, who probably a lot of people might know, was there. And I was speaking to him. He said to me, Russ, he said, if we make a difference to one person this weekend, this whole event will have been a success. And I spoke to probably 30, 40 people that day and we had a number of events over the weekend. But just one person... Prof would have thought it had been a success. And that really stuck home to me. I thought, yeah, we might make a big difference to that one person and change their life. Yeah, and it, it is so valuable. And it's also remember, important to remember that because for some of the stuff we can do, let's say it can feel like quite a long game. Um, so, you know, like I look over to chat at the minute and there's somebody in chat that this week I connected with for the first time because of a video they saw on the channel or whatever. And, and that's just that little reminder that you kind of need that that's all it takes. If it just, if it, it starts one conversation or makes one person feel less alone or helps them, you know, cope a little bit better with the days, then, then that's kind of, you know, you're doing far more than that, Russ, I should probably point out, but you help okay. far more people. And, and on so many levels as well, like, let's like say it's really important. Like somebody can see a man writing poetry and in such a candid way that you do, um, and can relate to that and, and get some, um, you know, some uh, comfort from that. But then there's also the the advocacy stuff you do and the focus groups and the, the um, research stuff that you do. Plus, we haven't even got onto you sort of um, being a sort of trustee as well. And, 
you know, so yeah, <laughs> on behalf of everybody here watching or that will watch this over the coming months, you're doing far more than helping one person. I think we should probably make sure you're aware of. <laughs> well, well, thanks. I appreciate that. But there's also the other side of it, Joel, as well. There's, there's not enough men do what we do. No. Like most of the focus groups I think you've been to, that I've been to over the years, there'll be plenty of ladies there, plenty of girls, and very few men because we seem, like you said before, we're not able to talk about things. So, I think it's really important from that point of view that like to me and you do get out there and at least men have got a voice. Yeah. And it can be frustrating. I think for any men watching this that would like to do get involved more, um, don't let it put you off because it can feel frustrating. You know, like we often joke over on the Twitch channel about how like, you know, I'm never going to get past a certain ceiling on that platform being a, you know, man approaching 40, talking about my feelings, you know, and because some people are uncomfortable with that. But I think for whilst people are uncomfortable with that, we have to keep banging that drum, don't we, until it it becomes more normal and people are more willing to to listen to people like us sharing these experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yes. let's do that. I think as well, I just want to touch upon, I might be completely wrong, but throughout your story, you've talked a lot about, so we get lots of people on here talking about bad experiences, you know, and I've got plenty of them as well, and that's totally understandable. I think what's been really refreshing is you've talked a lot about your medical professions and professionals in a really positive way, like, I'm guessing that they were a key part in you sort of going down this path and and doing more than just sort of looking after yourself sort of thing. Well, I, I have the best relationship possible with um, my prof. And do, I'll, one little anecdote I'll tell you, they absolutely gobsmacked me. For years, I would not been able to follow my club. I support Manchester City in Europe. And I was finally well enough to go. And I went to see his play by Munich. So I went with my mates and I did what my mates do. So we had a few beers, then we had a few more beers. And as it goes, you know, yeah. I had a great four days away in Munich, watch my club, come home. And the week after I was in clinic and I went in and said, hi, Prof. And he said, hi, Russ. He says, uh, how was it? And I think you should always be brutally honest with your medical profession. No point lying to him. So I said, well, Prof. I said, to be honest, I said, I drank too much. And his reply was, good. And I went, good? I said, well, what do you mean, good? I was expecting a proper telling off. Yeah. And he said, no, good. And I said, I don't understand why. He said, you're doing what your mates are doing. That means I'm doing my job. That's so good to hear. <laughs> I, I'd never, ever considered that before. Yeah, no, it's because like I, we talk a lot about acceptable outcomes on here and how they're different for individuals. And it's never asked like it's never I, I very rarely get asked in my appointments. What do I want? You know, like I don't care about blood tests and sometimes I don't care about how much of my body is covered in a rash. Sometimes you just want to be able to do what you make to do. And don't you? And yeah, and, and live the life you wanted to lead, even if it's just for a weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that again, that changed my whole outlook on things. I was like, wow. You know, as long as I do look after myself, as long as I am sensible, I can do these sort of things. And I do do them now. Yeah. And I think with my prof's blessing, because he knows that I like to do these things. He knows that it's probably beneficial for my mental health and stuff to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so in the end, it's far better that I go and be naughty for a few days, you know, than sit home and do nothing and like, just watch the telly and, you know... Exactly. <laughs> like I, I I am well aware that alcohol is a massive trigger for my psoriasis. You know, within within a couple of days of me drinking alcohol, I will get new rashes. Um, and it, I've always had this sort of wonder if I was also slightly allergic to it because it's like it's almost like it's it happens too quickly, you know, for psoriasis. Like the the rashes start being a problem like too quickly. But like you say, is that balance and your mental health, you know? Because if I if I stop doing that entirely, am I gonna suffer more than the odd cheat week or whatever that might look like when it's a you know your mate's weekend away or something um and i but i think the really important bit is like you sound like you are it's like being really honest about it and being honest with yourself like you say being honest to the doctors because you wouldn't want them to lie to you so you shouldn't be lying to them and so, saying, you're saying you know what yes this isn't good for me if it was a prolonged thing but on this occasion it was better because it gave me the release i needed from what i was struggling with mentally or, or whatever that might look like you know yeah yeah, and I, I have had issues in the past, um, bad issues. I ended up in hospital with through drink and what have you. Well, I've I've got it under control now, and 
I used to know I went out, went to the football yesterday with the lads and we had a good day, good day drinking. But I have now what, what I like to call the three-day day. Yeah. Whereas the day before, I won't do anything. I'll try and chill out. I'll have a rest and make life easy. And then they have a day where it's right. No treatments, nothing. And tomorrow, today, I'm going to blast it. Today, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And then, like, today, I've been at home, not done anything today, sat and had some dinner, watched some telly, just generally chilled out. And the news coming on here tonight as well, so I've had that to look forward to all day. You know, and it's just a rest day. And then tomorrow, you know, back to doing what I do tomorrow. Yeah. But I think, I think us talking about that sort of side of it, because anyone can go and share all the positives, and, and I often upset a lot of people on Instagram by using hashtags like real life, not filtered life, and, and all this sort of stuff, because I think if you only show that one side, you are setting an impossible bar that people reading that content or consuming that content are always going to feel inferior. And and yes, I think I have my moments where I try and like be inspirational, but I think it's also equally as important to say, you know, this side of it is a bit crap and it affects me yeah. or if I drink and it's going to cause me these problems. And because if you don't, I just think about like, you can, you can try and help as many people as you like. If you're setting this bar that the average person at home scrolling through social media is never going to meet, then you're not helping people. You're kind of, yeah. you're not, not lifting anyone up, are you ultimately? No, you're not, you're not giving them any reason to, to do any better for themselves. But whereas if you do say to people, you know, if you do look after yourself a little bit more, you can do this. Yeah. I mean, don't do it to the excess. I don't go mad, obviously, but, you know, you can have things to look forward to, and which will be better for you in the long run because you've got that interaction with people and you're not locking yourself away, like just staring at a TV set all day. And that is yeah. such an easy trap to slip into, isn't it? Yeah. Someone who went through the whole shield and thing, like I still haven't fully got past that. I used to be so sociable. I'd be out every other day. And now the, um, you know, it's going to sound really embarrassing, but sod it, I share everything. The other day the window cleaner came and I shut the curtains because I was having a low mood day. I don't know if you can relate to this. And I just like the thought of having a conversation with somebody I don't know very well, I just didn't didn't want it and i shut the curtains and pretend like i weren't here yeah. <laughs> and it's absolutely stupid but it's important we talk about it because it's like that was just purely because my body confidence and everything else that day had taken a dip and the last thing i wanted to do was socialize and it's so hard to bring yourself back out of that that place isn't it yeah it can be you know you can you can get isolated and especially like over um over lockdown and what have you it's become a really difficult time and I wrote a blog piece about lockdown for um, Innovation Health Manchester and with the Therese Association as well, well, for So Protect, I think it was, about it being our normal. We weren't suffering as much as anybody else because we're used to it. Yeah, We're used to those feelings. We're used to being the ones who were at home and who were struggling. Other people aren't. So it must have been harder for them than us. You know, yeah, and that's a that's a really unique way of looking at it as well because um, not, you know, not everybody did, and I know there were certainly times during that period that I felt hard done by as somebody that was you know at risk and immunocompromised and that. So it yeah. says a lot about you that your angle was people that aren't used to that must be really struggling because it, that really went against the, the 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 current of what everyone else was sort of talking about. Yeah, absolutely. You know. Like, and it was, it was a difficult time, I think, as well, for a lot of people, like, during COVID. You know, things like speaking to your doctors and also getting your treatments and, and that. And I can imagine a lot of people really did suffer. I mean, I think I'd come through it okay, you know, um, even though I've now had COVID three times. Uh, <laughs> it, if you tell them a bit hoarse, I've just had it recently and I'm still not oh, getting sorry to hear that. I'm still, like, struggling a little bit with my breathing and, like, I'm a bit hoarse today. Yeah. You know, but such is life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, we are definitely more resilient, aren't we? We don't always feel like it sometimes, I think, but because we've had to roll with those punches that maybe other people don't don't appreciate, that um it definitely and I always talk about like my ability to manage pain depends on how resilient I am. And that feeds into that, yeah. like changes in my condition, changes in my rashes, changes in my mental health. Um so I, I do think we're probably a lot tougher than we probably give ourselves credit for, you know. Absolutely. I, I think that's really, really true. You know, like with pain, I think as you, 
you get used to it. You have this ability to, it's there. You know it's there. But you can sort of put it in a box and have it there, have it in a different place in your head yeah. and not think about it. Yeah. But you know it's there, but you just go on with it regardless. Even yeah, though that, That's pain know. management taught me a lot about that sort of side of things because I think for a lot of us, we're always looking for something to fix something, aren't we? And I was in this position where I was like, I had to accept that my pain wasn't going away and nobody was coming to sort of save me from it. And like you say, being able to sort of place it further back in your sort of mindset makes a makes a big difference, doesn't it? It does, you know. And there's only one time I think pain really ever got to me. And I had a, a, a flares in both my shoulders at the same time. And especially in the tendons across my shoulders. And I didn't sleep for about three days. I couldn't get comfy lying down. I couldn't sit comfortably. And in the end, I got the emergency doctor out, hoping he'd give me a pain injection. And of course, because of viral shipment, they're not allowed to give me injections anymore. And he just gave me a prescription for codeine. And I went to the shop and got some codeine, rammed about a dozen codeine down my neck because I was desperate. And the actors were thinking, that's just stupid. What are you doing? No, but it happens though, doesn't it? And you, it happens all too often. And, and that's why we're campaigning for things like more holistic healthcare options where and multidisciplinary approach. Well, you've heard me bang on about this before, yeah. Russ, but you know yeah. what I mean? That you can't just give people a prescription and expect that to just address the issue when the address, the issue is multi layered, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's not, it's not just the pain, it's what it stops you doing or how it makes you feel or how it affects your sleep and, and yeah. everything else. And sleep, sleep being possibly the most important thing for me, yeah. you know. And as I have um, this thing about, and I'm dreading it because the clocks are going to change shortly. And the clocks changing for some reason just mess me up. Yeah. And I don't know why. And I, My I, thing is once I get woken up, once I get, and I don't know about you, I feel like with psoriatic arthritis, we get a double whammy because if it isn't the pain, sometimes I'll just get in bed at night and just the sheets will just, start an itching thing that you then can't stop and and you miss you miss then that window when you're going to fall asleep and then the more frustrated you get the more you itch and it's just like it just never ends you know? yeah before you know it's three o'clock in the morning and you're like <laughs> thinking i may as well get up yeah <laughs> then you and get then, up and you're wide awake and and then your doctors are wondering why your mental health side is more important to you at that time than the pain might be because like my, my argument is if i could get a good night's sleep i could deal with stuff so much better yeah. than you know, so suddenly that issue that might be there might be down here now because I'm I'm rested. You know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, about eight hours. You got a good eight now, eight hours sleep. You could cope with anything pretty much the next yeah. morning. Yeah. You know, well, you don't, and there's nothing worse than a restless night where you're tossing and turning, and you look at the clock and you think, "Oh, it's only one o'clock." I thought it's like five o'clock. Yeah. And you nod off, and you want, and it's two o'clock, and it's like, "Oh no." <laughs> And why do you always nod off at like five o'clock when you know the alarm or whatever's going to go off in yeah. an hour or two? Yeah. But but you're wide awake all up until that point, and then you'd have been better off just staying awake by that point, yeah. you know, and, and you can't. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So um, so like we we talked a lot about like the condition and everything and and all the um awesome stuff. Like you're involved in so many things. Like, I literally can't. I don't think I can move in research projects and stuff without coming across to you at some point. Yeah. What what made you then want to get into sort of like the um. I'm guessing it's probably the same themes, but you know, you recently um, become a trustee as well, I believe. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's trustee of the Association. I'm really, really proud of that, and I've done a lot of work with the Swiss Association over the years, and become good friends with Dominic, who sadly has left recently. Like, whereas we we had a connection, like he was yeah. a football fan, I'm a football fan, and he's a lovely man as well. Yeah, lovely yeah. lad, yeah. And opportunities that had come up, like he always said, Russ, do you fancy doing this? And pretty much, yeah, I'll do that. You know, and I was thinking to myself, you know, I'd like to get more involved. I wonder what I could do to get more involved. And fortunately for me, Helen, Helen McAteer, the CEO, was also thinking that at the same time. So at the last Sarai's Association and conference, it's called over the chairman and had a little bit of a chat and I was like, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And I spoke to Nick over a Zoom meeting, and he said, right, Russ, he said, I'm going to recommend you. I think you'd be perfect for the job. Awesome. And then I got accepted by the other trustees, and 
Yeah, no, I'm a trustee. Um, so I've done the, I had to do a training course for it where you had to learn about some of the law and behind it and what have you. Which is really interesting, actually. You know, good to know. And I'm hopeful that in, the, in that position, I can help push things maybe different ways because I think there's nothing more powerful than what we did with Tracy Shell out. And we're out, actually out on the streets speaking to people. And we've got people coming up to us and saying, I've had this for 40 years and I've never spoke to anybody about it. I've never seen it. And you can actually tell them what's there. And you, maybe I might have a doctor with you like on a on a show on a street. And I'd like to maybe in the future see if we could push that a little bit further and maybe do more road shows and get more people involved. And, you know, because not everybody's got a computer. Not everybody's comfortable speaking like over the internet, whereas he might be comfortable coming and speaking to somebody on the street and saying, "Is is is this a racist?" Do you think? You've you've got to meet patients where they are, and I know regulars. I'm sorry because you probably heard me say that about eight times yesterday alone. But it's the same reason why I've started doing the whole. You know, yesterday we were playing Minecraft all day with a group of people that just wanted to lean on each other, and and I'm I'm uncomfortable with that. It's not something I've done before, but you could see that there was this group of people there that that used that as a platform to escape and deal and live with their sort of long term health conditions. So we sort of set something up to to bring people together and. And I think that, like the roadshow stuff, you've got to meet people where they are because um, you know that you can't just expect people. You can't lay on services and expect people to come on to you. You know that's why there's so many sort of um, charity services that have sort of low uptake, isn't it? Because it's just like the services are amazing, but you've got to kind of try and meet people halfway. They're not just going to walk through the door. And so yeah, I think that stuff's great. And I think also, um, you know, on behalf of the community as well, when I saw that announcement, you you being trustee there, it just it was. It was brilliant. I certainly thought it was great news because I think anywhere we can get lived experience in those um, those places yeah. and in those roles, um, and especially because you know you're similar to me and you shoot through the hip from the hip and say say what you think and everything else, yeah. and I think there ain't enough of that in the world sometimes. Um, so um, yeah, I think on behalf of patients, that was great news, and I very much look forward to um, seeing how you help shape and and steer those guys and. And keep doing because they, you know, everybody knows how I feel about the Trust Association, a brilliant, brilliant charity. And they, they, without sound and sort of condescend, they, they punch far above their weight as well with the impact that they have. Um, yeah, just amazing organization. And, and, and with you involved as well, that can only, you know, be a, be a better thing. So, um, yeah, good work on that. And, and thanks again for, um, giving up more of your time for this cause. <laughs> yeah, well, cheers. I appreciate it. Look, you don't talk about shooting from your hip. I was at a meeting in London a couple of weeks ago of the musculos I can't say that word musculoskeletal research group. Yeah. And they're on behalf of the Manchester Research Group and as, as a psoriatic arthritis patient. And they had a top table of doctors and they were talking medical stuff all morning without any concern for the public engagement people there. Spoke at a level way too high, way above what our knowledge was. And then in the afternoon, he started talking about biologics. And I just put my hand up and he said, yeah, I've got a question. I said, have any of you actually taken a biologic? <laughs> <laughs> and they all looked at each other. I said, because if you haven't, why don't you come and ask me what it's like? Yep. Yeah, and they just all looked at it. And, at the end of it, um, the organiser called me um, a, dis a crazy horse, a disruptor. <laughs> I, I, I how... love when people still use disruptor as a bad thing. You yeah. Know what I mean? like, well, she was saying it as a good thing. Oh, that's good then. That's yeah, good. <laughs> good like, this is why we want people like you at these events, because mm -hmm. you're prepared to ask questions. 100%. 100%. That other people might not ask. And a couple of doctors come to me as well at the end of it as we're packing up. Unfortunately, I had so much job to get the train. They come to me and said, thank you for asking that question. So nobody's ever asked us that before. Yeah. You know, and it's right, isn't it? We're, yeah, the, we're totally. the experts. Yeah, and 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 we I think there's two there's two areas as well. Like from my experience and the travels I've done over the last year and everything, you've got that group of pe people that are absolutely crying out for more lived experience and they want co production and they can see the value in it and that's amazing. But then you've also got the others that 
I don't know, see it as some sort of threat. And I don't, I, I can, I'll never be able to get my head around that because even if you have like a really healthy co production set up with lived experience and medical professionals, it's always going to be difficult for us to carry the same weight because we're not the ones who are making decisions, holding budgets and everything else. So we're on a hide to nothing anyway. So yeah. why anyone would see us as a threat is just beyond me. But just a little anecdote is like I found last year when I was out in Italy doing EADV. Um, I'd done a talk out there and I was on a panel with um, medical professionals, lovely, lovely people and really made the right stuff in terms of they really valued me being there. But my name and face wasn't on the poster. My name and wasn't on the board outside the, the, the um, presentation room. And there was even a debate whether the four screens oh. where all the panel would sit as whether my name should be up there. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not some like pariah that shouldn't be here. If you want me to come all the way out to another country and do a talk, at least give me the credit. You know what I mean? And absolutely. And, yeah. and, it, and in the end, it was the medical professionals that that got that turned over. You know, they were like all for it. Um, so it, it seems to be like people higher up, you know, the institutions and the the people that behind the conferences and the congresses and everything else that seem to have a a weird thing about that but you ask most doctors they they love us being involved but we've got to get it from being this thing where we're sort of wheeled out and we're almost like a novelty to it just become an absolutely part of the fabric haven't we so you don't even distinguish the difference you know well th thankfully now though with a lot of re research that's been done with innovation health manchester in that area a lot of um, research bids will struggle for funding from the nhir unless they include PPIE from the beginning, which is right. Yeah. We have to be there from day one. We have to be there on day one to say yes. <laughs> this is what we want. Because we're the patients. Yeah, totally. And how many, honestly, yeah. feel free, to, you don't have to honest, honest, answer honestly if you don't, but how many times when you got those calls from people like Dom and that and you'd go do the focus group and you realise within five minutes you are coming in right at the very end when everything's been decided and you can't shape anything. All you can do is verify what they've done or not. And and my argument's always been that's pointless at that point because that might not be Russ's need. It might not be my need. It might, you know, who determined that was the need anyway? Um, so like you say, from the very start to the very end, that's the only way it'll it'll properly work, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, because it's the whole point of it is our needs to be met. Yeah. Not the medical professionals needs to be met. Yeah. Totally. You know, so they, they should always work with us because we are the experts. Yeah. You know? and, and like I say, just, um, it's going to take a – I think we, it feels like we're getting there now. When I was doing this sort of five years ago, I don't know, it felt it felt like a pointless exercise. I feel like we st I still hit set setbacks. Like literally for every couple of good weeks I have, I have a really demoralising one. I had one recently this week where I was just like, you think, oh, why do I bother? You know, I'm no threat to you. I'm just a guy – with a voice trying to help other people you know what i mean i'm not like i've got no budget i've got no funding yeah. i'm not going to take your funding i'm not you know i don't know why people see that but it's unfortunately we keep running into that and um the sooner people realize that they can you like well you look at all the stuff you're doing you know and and i know a big chunk of it is probably you know goodwill and in your own free time and you know all that sort of stuff so um imagine what could be achieved if we made that more like on the level of the professionals as well, you know, as a profession almost, you know, it's just, yeah, it frustrates me. I'm not going to go onto that subject yeah. too much, but it's, 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 I take comfort in knowing I'm not the only one who's had those experiences. Uh, me too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I feel like I could talk to you for hours, Russ, because me and you have got very similar views and I don't want to keep you too much longer. Have you? Can I ask you to share one more poem since the last one was so I'll awesome? Am I putting you on, on the spot by doing you know? that? Um... This is a poem I wrote for a little campaign called Stop the Stare. I'll read this one to you. My skin causes me nightmares. My brain, it cannot sleep. In there, in there people stop and stare. I'm sad and start to weep. I know it is not personal. I know some people care. Yet that does not stop them from giving you that stare. The fear of not knowing, lack of knowledge of what's a flare. People being inquisitive will stop and give you that stare. If we could raise awareness that helps others treat us fair, then one day in the future, 
we could stop the stairs. That time is now upon us for our souls to be bad. To raise the profile of our cause, it's time to stop the stairs. Brilliant. <laughs> virtual round of applause i'm sure from everyone else that's watching as well thank you russ i i feel like we need a dedicated poetry reading event now on here one night <laughs> we'll just get a load of people in to share <laughs> yeah, Why not? yeah i think i yeah. think as well like i say because like i know when i i share my stuff online it's like a lot i'll get like a, a good reception from the people that have been sort of with me a long while or or, or maybe sort of like older females i think it's probably fair to say but you don't you very rarely get a male interaction on that but you know that people are reading it you know people are listening and, and somebody just commented in the chat to say it's nice to see men talking openly about how they're feeling and it's just oh yeah listening to you read that i've just planted that seed that this, this should be something we set up an event or something where we just get men talking about this stuff i think it'd really help someone out there right well i'd always be happy to uh, take part in any poetry reading and i write some new stuff even Brilliant. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, if anyone's watching this, either live or back and would like to get involved in that, drop me a message. We'll, we'll get it done. We'll get it set up. That that definitely feels like something. Um, Again, that's about meeting people where they are. And if that appeals to somebody, then then, yeah, we should definitely be um be doing more more with that. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that, Russ. I really appreciate yeah. it. It, it. It clearly it doesn't bother you, but <laughs> I really appreciate I really appreciate you doing that. It's not every day you have to come on YouTube and, and read them out live. So um, thank you so much. Um. Is there anything else you want? If I feel like we've covered a lot, and I feel like we could have gone onto a whole show on every single subject because you're, you've you've got so much experience in this area and such awesome um, views and opinions and everything. Is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to to share or, or say to anyone watching this that that might have been where you were in the past and and how they can either get involved or help themselves a little bit with some of the outlets you use? I think the one thing I would say is never give up hope. You know, from where I was when my journey started to where the medical profession is here today is a totally different planet. You know, when I started and I was in hospital having tar treatment for weeks on end, to now there's a huge amount of biologics out there that all do specific things. There is far more hope now for people like us than there ever has been. You know, so... I know people will still be down. I know people still have bad days. But there's far more hope than the dark days when I first had it and I was thinking nothing's going to help me. So that would be my message to everybody. Keep smiling. 